Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Feels very apropos that just moments ago, having fairly poorly delivered the prayer for the state of Israel, that this morning I want to speak about the topic of forgiveness and reconciliation. I know no one's going to hold a grudge for my subpar singing abilities, but I want to talk about this topic partly because it's very apropos today's Parsha, which we'll get to. Also because we are at the turn of a secular year. And any time that we mark moments in the world with our calendar, the topic of checking in with ourselves and thinking about where we're at tends to arise. What did we do right last year? What did we do wrong? And where do we hope to improve? And the other reason that this topic is on my mind is because I do have two young children. They're four and a half and three, and they get into quite a bit of spats between the two of them. They're generally very loving, but I'm starting to think that my parenting technique of forcing apology is not quite the right approach. Now, the truth is, is I want, when one of them does something wrong to the other, for them to feel a sense of responsibility for their action. That is the goal. But when I force an apology, I sometimes feel like the message gets a little bit lost in the scuffle. I'm like, come on, apologize. <laughs> but I'm sorry. And then you kind of move on from it. And that idea of actually feeling the ways that our actions impact others in our lives never really gets quite through. I'm sorry becomes kind of a shallow admission and not the deep soul searching I'm sorry that's required when we truly, truly mean that we feel that we've done something wrong and we seek to repair. The scene that we witness in today's parsha, Vayigash, is uh, very remarkable for the promise of reconciliation that it offers between Joseph and his brothers, who, you'll recall, have deeply, deeply wronged him. When Yehuda approaches Yosef at the beginning of our parsha. We're told by Yigash, Yehuda, that Yehuda draw close, drew close. And Yehuda does not know that he is approaching his brother Joseph. But Joseph and we, the reader, know just how intense and complicated the moment we are witnessing is. It isn't just about someone who feels supplication towards a ruler, a supremely powerful person. It's also the inversion of a power dynamic that has followed Joseph up to this very moment. That up until this moment, it has been a question in Joseph's life, life of what happened back then. How did my brothers, how did my father leave me in this vulnerable state? And where have I gotten to at this moment? When the rabbis see that Joseph so willingly offers forgiveness, they're a little bit baffled by it. How can someone who has had so much wrong done be so ready, not just to forgive, but to tell a story about all the reasons why this moment is exactly how it had to be. That is just what Joseph says. He, he says to the brothers in a remarkable statement, don't even go there. Don't even begin to think about your own sense of guilt. What is happening here is exactly what it should have been. Do not be distressed. It was to save life that God sent me ahead of you. And everything that has happened up till this point has been preordained, or we might say, is exactly how it needed to be. 
First, let's take a moment to just imagine who this character of Joseph is that is able to say that with no, um, he's not met by his brothers in that moment. They don't approach him knowing the situation, first of all. And second of all, once the situation is revealed, they don't say, oh my God, Joseph, we're so sorry. We never get the satisfaction of their apology. All we see is Joseph, who rushes in to hug and to kiss his brothers. There was also a scene of reconciliation that happened between our ancestors that ended with a kiss. And that was between Jacob and Esau. And in that moment, the language is strikingly similar because what we have in our parsha is and he fell on the neck of Binyamin, his brother, and he cried. And Binyamin cried too on his neck. And then, and then he kissed all of his brothers and he cried on them. When we saw Esau and Jacob meet, the words that our Torah said is, Fayarats Esav likrato, and Esav ran to greet him or to meet him, Vayichab kehu, and he hugged him, Vayipul al tvarav, and he fell on his neck, Vayishakehu, and he kissed him, Vayevku, Vayivku, and he kissed him, and they wept together. When it says Vayishakehu, there's little dots above that word in the Torah. And so the sages tried to interpret what that could mean. And they assumed that Esav didn't really kiss him with a whole heart. That those dots that were written into the Torah are to say to us that this was not a kiss of actual forgiveness with a whole heart. But Ibn Ezra, a medieval rabbi, interprets it differently and says, you know what, this is crazy. Like, Esav had to have been actually dis uh, displaying real forgiveness here because this scene that we see between Jacob and Esau is just like the scene later where Joseph is reunited with his brothers. And Ibn Ezra says, we know we are certain that Joseph truly forgives his brothers in that moment. So back to our Parsha and this idea that Joseph displays true forgiveness in that moment. We have to admit that this is remarkable and, how, and yet it is indisputable that Joseph truly forgives his brothers. So much so that in next week's Parsha, when the brothers themselves doubt that Joseph truly means his apology, or not his apology, his acceptance of what has happened, they ask him again, Joseph, <laughs> we're, we're actually, we can't believe that you truly forgive the offense. And he says, have no fear. Am I a substitute for God? Although you intended me harm, God intended it for good. And so brought the present result, the survival of many people. Joseph has already gotten himself on his own terms to a place of forgiveness. He didn't need an apology. He didn't need closure from his brothers. And that is remarkable. In a blog post for the Times of Israel entitled, No Apologies, Just a Kiss, Dr. Joshua Berman, who's a professor of Bible at Bar Ilan University, picked up on these two kisses and made a really interesting observation. He said, social, social psychologists teach us that when it comes to rupture and repair in human relations, there are actually two types of cultures. There are cultures of forgiveness and there are cultures of reconciliation. Cultures of forgiveness are usually cultures with a strong sense of individual. That is our culture. It when there is something wrong that has been done, 
it creates a debt to the aggrieved. Only by writing the self can the offender hope to write the relationship. There's clarity in what's transpired, and that is the path through which the, the uh, hope of a redeemed future must travel, through the inner repentance of the person who has done wrong, through actually really meaning the I'm sorry's that we say. It should go without saying that those sorries are truly difficult to achieve. It takes reflection, presence, awareness, care, and a sense of mutual responsibility to walk through the world willing to take responsibility for all of the tiny wrongs that we do on any given basis. By contrast, cultures of reconciliation tend to focus on the collective. Who I am is entirely bound up in who we are the bonds we share, the common goals to which we aspire. And when a relationship is ruptured, a premium is placed on re-achieving harmony with those around us. Here, value is placed on letting go. Introspection by the offender and offers of apologies are of course always welcome, but not all are able or willing to do that work. And those cannot be preconditions for restoring harmony. So what does any of this mean for us? Who, of course, make mistakes. Who, of course, have shortcomings. In fact, in my mind, that's the whole lesson of life, is the sort of never-ending cycle of being in relationship. And when we are in relationship, we are vulnerable to each other. We do hurt one another, often not intending to do so. And the question becomes not, how do I avoid such hurt, but rather, how do I repair it? What kind of reconciliation is possible? And I think our Torah this week and this Dr. Berman offer us two really valuable possibilities. One, maybe we would say the North Star version. We do the hard introspection. We come to a place of being able to say truly, I recognize what I did wrong, and I am so sorry. And what's hard about that is sometimes the person who we offended is not ready to receive. And we still have to come to a place of accepting, like Joseph's brothers had to come to a place of accepting and truly believing that the harm done is done, and life will move on. We can't stay in that pit of wondering if we're bad forever. The other version, reconciliation, should be very interesting to us. It's a different attitude. It's not one that focuses on the person who did wrong. It's one that focuses on the person who feels wronged. And finding their own agency in that moment of feeling that something has been done wrong to us. Finding a way to actually say, even without that other person, I am mashlim. I am whole. I am okay. There are power dynamics behind that. There's complexity. This is not an easy move. But it could be a beautiful one to consider. As we look at our own lives, as we look at our own years past, and as we think about any of the unclosed loops, any of the uncompleted grudges that we may hold. So I hope for you, in 2023, a year of forgiveness, a year of reconciliation, and a year of wholeness for each and every one of us. Shabbat Shalom.